welcome to Science with Sanjula, where we talk about anything global health. My name is Sanjula Singh, and I am a researcher at the University of Oxford. Join me as I speak to world-leading scientists who tackle today's biggest challenges in healthcare. Today, we have a very special guest in the studio, Sir Tim Hitchens, who was the president of my college during my graduate school in Oxford. Tim, we're so delighted to have you in the studio today with us. Thank you very much. Could you please introduce yourself? So my name is Tim Hitchens. Uh, I am the president of Wolfson College, one of the colleges at Oxford University. And I've been here for maybe four years. Uh, I'm not an academic. I've spent 35 years working in the British diplomatic service before becoming uh, a president of a college at Oxford. Exactly. And if I'm not mistaken, you were a student at Cambridge yourself. Yes. I mean, this is always a sort of a tricky question. But yes, uh, I was an undergraduate at Cambridge, Christ College Cambridge, where I studied English literature. Why did you decide to study English literature? To be honest, because I loved it. It struck me as one of the most extraordinary luxuries that you could have to spend three years reading the best writing there was in the English language. And at the time, I thought it was fundamentally very enjoyable I wasn't sure how applicable it would be to the rest of my life. But in retrospect, most of my career has involved the ability to express yourself in words on paper or spoken in a clear way, and also to be able to understand what's going on behind somebody's words. Uh, And in politics or in any aspect of policy, um, being able to see what's going on behind what people are saying is really important. So, in fact, a lot of the most senior people in the Foreign Office, I discovered, had also studied English literature, uh, and they were great wordsmiths. And after studying English literature at Cambridge, how did your career take off from that point onwards? So at the age of 21, I started work as a diplomat, and I spent a year working in London on a number of different policy areas. And then I was selected to study Japanese. And so the next two years was seven days a week, 365 days a year, learning, speaking, writing Japanese. And could you maybe take me through like the highlights of your career? Well, of course, the highlight of my career is what I'm doing right now, clearly. (laughs) But um, just going through the sort of the government work, uh, Japan plays a big part of it. So I was both a young political secretary in Tokyo in the 1980s and ambassador, British ambassador, from 2012 to 2016. Uh, I spend a lot of time overseas, uh, also in Pakistan and Afghanistan as political counsellor. And I also spent time in Paris as deputy ambassador, uh, doing a lot of European work. Um, I spent quite a lot of time working on relations with African countries, sub-Saharan African countries and uh, also working on European issues. And then I had an interlude in the middle of about four years as one of the Queen's private secretaries. So those are probably the the high points, I guess. Yes, there are so many of them. (laughs) (laughs) I think I would like to start with talking about your time in Japan. You've informed me before that you were actually involved with some health policies in Japan. And I was wondering if you could share that story again with us. Certainly. The, uh, the relations with, uh, between Japan and Britain uh, go back a long, long way, back to the 19th century, where it all started, really. Uh, and trade and science have always been part of the relationship. And the British Embassy in Tokyo has a large team of people who are scientists, and it has a team connected to them who are nuclear scientists in particular. And science appears in many guises, but the one that was probably most vivid and most political was the Fukushima disaster in Japan, where a massive earthquake led to a tsunami, led to a nuclear power station uh, exploding, producing a, a cloud of some kind of radioactive material. And this produced a real concern both among the British and foreign community in Japan, but also among the Japanese themselves. And part of the issue was that in Japan, the nuclear establishment had been very highly praised and valued by the whole population 
people believed in the nuclear system and its full safe technology. And so when that technology failed, as it did during that explosion, public sentiment, having been utterly trusting of those scientists, switched exactly to the opposite, and nobody trusted any expert in Japan on nuclear issues. And that meant that in public discussion, there was nobody standing up in public and describing for the Japanese people or for the international community what the real risks were. And we found that because the British had great expertise in nuclear science, and because in Britain we have a system called SAGE, which is the Scientific Advisory Group in Emergencies, which brought in expertise from the best of science around the UK, and interestingly enough, because of the time difference between the two countries, you would be able to have a day when you got lots of data of what was going on in Japan, you could send it back to the UK overnight, and during the day in Britain, people, the scientists would analyze the data and would be able to explain what the risks were of that radioactivity, uh, what the risks were for where it would be, and the British Chief Scientific Advisor, John Beddington at the time, was able to be issuing statements which were absolutely vital both for the British population to decide whether to get on planes and fly out immediately, but also for the Japanese population to hear a balanced voice on the risks, but also what weren't the risks from nuclear power. And that influenced politics. It was good for Britain because we were seen as a place that was balanced, but it was useful for the Japanese population as well. Right. So I think that's such a perfect example of how diplomats as well have a very important role in, in making those health policies. What do you think that scientists in Japan could have done differently to maybe have one voice or have some form of like scientific leader um, to guide their own country through like a disaster like that? The answer is to have someone who is both inside government or inside a figure of authority but who also is able to be critical of and independent of political authority. And so that produces the trust because if the public hears somebody saying, don't worry, they believe it because they know that person has in other occasions said, do worry. Right. And so it's finding a system for people to speak up scientists to speak up in ways that can go against the political interests of a government right. for the sake of scientific truth. Do you think scientists and diplomats often speak the same language? Or do you think sometimes they have trouble understanding each other? When I joined the Foreign Office, in my intake of 20 people, there were maybe six who were scientists. So you want a number of people who can come in and who already understand the language of science. The other point I'd make is that I think good diplomats are the ones who can understand and listen to expertise across the board, be it scientific or economic or cultural, and turn that into language which can be easily understood by a broad audience. Because in a democracy, your job is to take difficult subjects and put it in ways that politicians can understand and take good decisions about and then can be communicated externally. So I think the diplomats themselves, we should regard ourselves as, as a cipher to turn complex issues into simple language, but recognizing that you mustn't oversimplify. Now I would like to invite you to give a mini lecture of about one minute. Whenever you're ready, please go ahead. If you live in a democracy as we, as we do, uh, the views of the people are the heart of sovereignty and our politicians, therefore, have to be the ones who take the lead in expressing the public view. But they won't be able to take the right decisions for us collectively unless they have the best expertise available to them. But if you have the experts trying to take the final decisions, they won't be aware of the democratic context.
And so this is where the context, the, the phrase experts on tap but not on top comes. I wouldn't claim to be an expert in anything really, <laughs> but I know a lot of people who are experts, who I can turn to, who have great wisdom, and I probably have an ability to integrate those in a way that is clear for people to understand. And I think that is more broadly true for any political system. You need access to the experts, scientific, economic experts, but you primarily need to be able to explain what they're saying in language that will get democratic consent or which is disagreed with by the public, but at least their views are expressed publicly. Very, very well said. I think even within a minute. So that's very, <laughs> very impressive. I have a follow-up question on that. So sometimes within the scientific field, experts do not agree with each other. How can you, how do you deal with that as a diplomat? This is one of the most difficult questions because most members of the general public don't understand the, the scientific method. And nor should they. It's not their job, right? It's not their job to understand it necessarily, but they should know that when you say we follow the science, that's not really true because the <laughs> science can take you in many different directions. And there is uh, a challenge with having groups that advise the government, which kind of suggests that there is one opinion that is the right opinion that the government listens to, whereas anyone who's involved in science knows that there are many, many opinions. Yes. But if lots of people express different opinions, that's not very helpful to policymakers. <laughs> yes, I can only imagine. So I personally think you need scientists willing to come to the government and talk about where central assumptions are on a particular issue, but without ever claiming that that is the right answer. In politics, people always try to shift the blame and responsibility onto others. You can't simply say, we follow the science, and if the scientists are wrong, it's their fault. Every one of us has to make judgments as we go. Yes, and could you please provide me with an example of your time in Africa? So one of the biggest challenges um, over the last 20 years in Africa has been the Ebola outbreak. outbreak. Um, primarily in Sierra Leone and Liberia, the West African area, which, as, as people will remember, was one of these terrible um, contagions that led in a very large percentage of cases to, to death. And it started as a disease that was affecting a local population. We then started to realize that it was moving very fast, much faster than... Uh, others would um, would have guessed. And then we started in the UK having the first cases coming to the UK as well. But we pretty soon realized that to get it under control, it was more than a purely medical affair because the way in which cultures in places like West Africa operate is not the same way as European countries operate. And that the way in which people who've died, the rituals for burial, the rituals for funerals, are very different from what one might expect elsewhere. And actually, a number of those rituals involved opportunities to transfer the disease. And there was a period at the beginning where we, we it was running away from us collectively, Ebola, and we brought in anthropologists. And the anthropologists were able to explain part of the reason why it was spreading so fast was these funerary practices. And so once you brought in the understanding culturally of the anthropology, the medical understanding of the way the disease spread, the politics of bringing governments together and making decisions, and the international effort through the World Health Organization, that collective effort is what produced eventually success in taming the disease. What were the lessons that you learned from that time period? Well, the, the main lesson is one about coordination, collaboration. So an example is working in Somalia. And people at the time often regarded Somalia as a failed state. It was had been taken over by al-Shabaab, the terrorist group. So there was a dealing with terrorism question. And we knew that quite a lot of those in al-Shabaab uh, 
were British Somalis who might well come back radicalised to the UK, so there's a terrorist aspect to it. There was also a piracy aspect to it because you had Somali pirates in ungoverned space going out and kidnapping, stopping vast cargo ships going past. There was an entirely human suffering point where Somali populations that had moved across into Kenya had created what at the time had become the largest refugee camp in the world. There was a political issue because you had both African nations trying to deal with it, but because Somalia is a predominantly Muslim nation, you also had Muslim nations wanting to deal with it. Um, and among the Muslim nations, there were conflicts between the Muslim nations with Qatar wanting to play a bigger role and Turkey wanted to play a bigger role. Um, so it was a real mess. It was a real confusion. And everyone was trying to deal with their particular policy, but nobody was bringing them all together and right. say, how do you make that work? And so it was one of those occasions that the British said, we're willing to put in 18 months to try to sort all of these different strands together. And I was asked to be the head of that particular uh, effort. Um, and it produced a solution that, I mean, none of these solutions last forever, but it actually reduced piracy, it reduced the suffering, it pushed back al-Shabaab, and it reduced the terrorist threat. And it wow. made sure that the Middle Eastern countries were involved. So my broad point is that the lessons I've learned are that you can't deal with one particular problem. You need to deal with them all collectively or else you'll start conflicting with other activities. Which sounds like a you know, fantastic advice, but how does one actually do that in practice? How do you speak with all those different parties? And well, what you have to do is you have to get, first of all, your own prime minister to want to do it mm -hmm. because it needs from the top that energy, that resource. I mean, I suspect in the UK case, we had a prime minister who probably understood the terrorist threat and the terrorist threat to the British the, exactly. the Olympic Games and wanted to find out how to deal with that. And as he asked those questions, you explained how all of these things fitted together and that you weren't going to answer the terrorist question without answering the humanitarian question and the piracy question and the regional security question. And did you ever feel like you had a, had a tough time explaining people that you were coming from another country, trying to help them, but you're still a foreigner to them, you're, you're, you're still British? Did that ever play a role? Well, it's, it's, it's always the case. I mean, there would be no purpose in trying to support Somalia achieve something if you didn't feel and you didn't know that most of the communities in Somalia wanted you to succeed and were willing to work with you. And we managed to get to a situation where the only community in Somalia that didn't want us to work and succeed was Al-Shabaab. And that was fine because they were <laughs> beyond the pale. But everybody else was working with us. But it takes a long time to understand who they are, to talk to them. One has to be able to bring their concerns into the solution. Exactly. What do you think makes a good diplomat? What makes a good diplomat, first of all, is absolutely believing that compromise is a desirable and admirable thing. That compromise isn't second best. Compromise is the best, because if you don't compromise, you don't get solutions. So you have to believe in moderation and compromise. Secondly, you need to be absolutely passionately interested and curious about situations. So you don't want to bring yourself into those situations. You want to understand what makes somebody else tick. You know, you want to really understand what makes al-Shabaab tick in Somalia. You want to think, what's it like to be Turkey trying to develop their role in this part of the world? Why are they doing it? Uh, you have to think about... What is it that has led a Somali woman and her children to have trekked across the border to be in this refugee camp? And you have to be really interested, quite separate from wanting to find a solution. So maybe keeping the interest and the desire to solve kind of separate for as long as you can. Otherwise, you'll bring your own prejudices about what the solution is. 
before you've heard what their worldviews are. At the end of every podcast episode, I always ask my guests two questions um, to give people advice, first of all, on a professional level and second of all, on a personal level. Well, my first bit of advice is that never separate the personal from the professional Ah. (laughs) and that the best career decisions are ones that take your personal relationships into account. Uh, And the best decisions I've made have been ones that have taken my family interests or my wife's interests or my children's interests absolutely front and centre. And uh, the second is always to try to go to places you feel uncomfortable in. Um, There's a quote by John Milton, the English poet, which is rather 17th century in its language, but it says, that which purifies us is trial, and trial is by what is contrary. And I think if you keep walking towards the fire, going towards the storm, trying things you feel uncomfortable with, you'll build resilience, you'll build your abilities, and you'll end up looking back and thinking, my goodness, how did I achieve all of that? And that certainly has been my my aim, you know, try to learn the hardest language I could find, go and work in some of the hardest places you can imagine. And if you even achieve half of that, you'll have achieved an enormous amount. Thank you so much for having this fascinating conversation with me today, Tim. And this actually leads us to the end of the first series of the Science with Angela podcast. It's been a great honor to interview some of the brightest minds in the population health space. And we hope that you enjoyed listening to our podcast too. Please feel free to reach out to us via any of our social media platforms. Thank you very much. <laughs>